Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Jim Krogmeyer. I'm here representing Arvind Rahman. And this is really the final event of our spring series on celebrating our associate professors. So today we're going to hear, today we're going to hear from three of our associate professors, Neera Jain from Mechanical Engineering, Joseph Jewell from Aero Astro, and Yunji Tong from BME. There will be time to ask questions. They're going to each make a presentation that talks a little bit about their research, engagement, teaching, and maybe their perspectives on the path that got them to this successful state. And um, there will be opportunities to ask questions, and uh, they will each be introduced by their heads. And so the first head is Echo Grohl from Mechanical Engineering. Thank you, Jim. So. Uh, Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I have the great honor to uh, introduce uh, Neera Jane, who uh, is just a, a wonderful person overall, but also a, a great educator and researcher in the School of Mechanical Engineering. Right? She has made uh, just unique and uh, very impactful contributions to her research endeavors, and uh, has also, uh, over the years, shown a, a great commitment uh, to the educational aspects of uh, the School of Mechanical Engineering and, and uh, Purdue overall, the College of Engineering, of course, but also to engagement, various engagement activities. Uh, her research focuses on studying the dynamical behavior and controls of both engineered and human systems uh, using analytical and computational modeling, optimal control, and uh, experimental validation. Uh, the research is motivated uh, by current and future cognitive dynamics, reduced order dynamic models of complex thermal fluid thermal sciences phenomena, and also by new algorithms for the design and control of the next generation of uh, thermal management systems. Uh, research is funded through a variety of sources, including the federal government, like the National Science Foundation, Office of Naval Research, uh, but also uh, through strong industrial support uh, with uh, various industrial partners. Um, and uh, our research has been recognized uh, through uh, various different aspects in her career, including she has been named a Forbes contributor. Uh, that was very exciting to see, like a series uh, of uh, articles. I, um, a very uh, uh, great just recognition for Purdue overall. Uh, invitations to contribute to special journals, uh, special issues, uh, books, has given quite a few invited seminars over a year, received best paper awards with her students, and just uh, also through uh, the industry partners that are mentioning, adopting some of her research. Um, uh, and then uh, finally, I would like to mention uh, she actually is also a recipient of an NSF Career Award. Uh, so with that, I will invite Neera to come up and uh, give the presentation. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is this mic? Oh, yeah, it's on. All right, well, thanks, uh, Eckhard, for that introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Thanks to everyone who took the time to come um, and attend, and also thanks to the dean's office um, for organizing the event, um, particularly uh, Darla Mazur, um, who I interacted with quite a bit leading up to this. Um, so um, we were um, given a lot of latitude in how to approach this talk, um, and you're going to see that um, I'm going to focus a lot more on the personal um, than the professional. I think a lot of folks here um, know about things I've done professionally, maybe know a lot less about me personally. So this is um, a much more uh, uh, personal view of my journey um, to becoming uh, Professor Jane. Um, so before I can talk about my journey to becoming a professor, I really need to first talk about my journey to engineering. Um, I was raised in Libertyville, Illinois. It's a northwest suburb of Chicago. Um, those are all my school mascots. <laughs> um, and my father um, is an endocrinologist, um, and so obviously he wanted me to be an MD. Um, in fact, there's no engineers on either side of my family, but many, many physicians. Um, my mother wanted me to be an MD or a lawyer, also very typical, I think, of an Indian mother. <laughs> um, but my life plan, I remember stating very clearly in second grade um, that I wanted to be a math teacher. Um, I loved math, I loved school, 
Um, and I think I was aware um, at a very young age um, how much my teachers influenced me. And I remember thinking, what an awesome responsibility. Um, what a great way to be able to impact others. And I think unlike a lot of other young um, kids, nothing really else came along that I wanted to do. Um, year after year, I remember my parents asking me, and I always said, nope, still a math teacher. <laughs> I was really sure that that was the plan. Um, the only thing that changed that um, was taking AP Physics B um, in high school. Um, and all of a sudden, all the math that I loved was being applied to practical problems, um, and it was awesome. <laughs> I absolutely loved physics. I was so lucky um, to have an amazing, uh, well, two physics teachers, but first, Mr. Mark Busing, um, who I, I might have had a crush on also, and, <laughs> um, uh, but um, who was an amazing physics teacher, um, and of course, at the end of the year, said, Nira, you should really consider majoring in engineering, applying to entering schools in the fall. Um, and Mr. Mark himself um, has a bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering from U of I, actually, um, and stumbled into teaching because, um, long story short, wherever he'd been living at the time, the physics teacher, I don't know, quit. I think there was a scandal. Um, and he substitute taught for a short time to fill in. Loved it so much that he left engineering, um, as actually will be retiring this year. It's his 25th year at my high school. Um, and at my reunion a couple years ago, shared this picture with me via text that he had saved um, from when I was in that class. That was some of my classmates. Um, so new life plan, I was going to major in engineering, work as an engineer, but just for a couple years, so that I could then go back and become a high school teacher exactly like Mr. Mark. Um, and I also, Mr. Bush was my AP Physics C teacher. I loved physics that much, took a second year of it in high school. Um, so sure enough, I went to MIT, majored in mechanical engineering, and did uh, achieve teaching certification in secondary mathematics in Massachusetts um, through their teacher education program. So life plan was still intact. <laughs> I still had everything lined up um, to do that. Um, a couple things I want to mention about MIT that were pretty formative for me. Um, the first and foremost, um, that's where I fell in love with control systems. Um, I took uh, my first controls class, Dynamics and Controls, as a sophomore, so it was pretty early. Um, uh, my professor was um, Professor David Trumper, super nice guy, absolutely loved the class. Similar story, I had taken differential equations a semester before, loved it. Got to this class, it was more differential equations, but now applied to practical problems. Um, and really, really could not get enough of it. Um, and I never took another ME class that I loved more. Um, and so I was sure really early on that uh, controls was within ME was the sub-discipline that I was most excited about. Um, the other person here that I want to mention, um, her name's Katie Bell. Um, Katie is now a robotics professor at UCSB, um, but she was my TA for that class. And um, I looked up to her to a lot. Um, I only had one female STEM professor my whole time as an undergraduate. Um, but Katie was awesome. We all loved her. Um, and she, so she was already a role model to me. And she ended up being a TA for the elective controls course that I then later took um, in college. And I actually did really badly on the first exam in that class. And for some reason, she was handing them back, um, not the professor. And I went to go pick up my exam. And she looked at me and she said, listen, before I give this back, you just promise me you're not going to drop the class. And I thought, yikes, <laughs> I did it really bad. Um, if she's saying that to me, but she did that, she gave me a hug and then gave me the exam. Um, and if she hadn't done that, I think I might have. I might have dropped the class. Um, I think I might have taken that as a clear signal that I wasn't cut out for controls. Um, and I mention this um, because TAs can have a huge impact on the lives of students, too. Um, Two other things I want to mention. Um, I became heavily involved in the MIT Public Service Center. Something I didn't mention about growing up is that my main extracurricular, besides band, I played the flute, um, was student council. Um, I was volunteering in elementary school, middle school. I was class president at one point in high school. Um, and so I got to MIT and was like, where's the volunteer work? Where's the service center? This is my thing. Um, and until then, service had always been organizing food drives and doing highway cleanup and things of that nature. Um, and it was the first time um, when I got to MIT that I became aware that I could use my technical skills um, as a means through impacting society. Um, and maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise, but it was. Um, it, that really um, completely changed my view of um, what I was doing and what was possible. Um, and 
thinking about engineering and my career as an engineer as a way that I'm impacting society has kind of now been um, a guiding light for a very long time. Um, and then the final thing um, is that I became even more passionate about gender issues in engineering. Um, I was very aware going to MIT of disparities of women in STEM, um, but through a lot of different experiences um, in college, um, became um, uh, even more aware of the challenges uh, that women and girls face, um, and graduated very determined um, not to be discouraged by anyone um, and to try to do as much as I could to make it easier for others. Okay. So how did I end up in graduate school? Well, unlike many of my um, peers, I did not have a formative undergraduate research experience <laughs> and advisor who encouraged me to go to graduate school. Um, but I did have an internship, interestingly, and coincidentally here in Indiana at Cummins, uh, working in their tech center. So I was working, I was in industry, but working with every, surrounded by engineers with masters or PhDs. Um, and Vivek Sujan, um, had a PhD in controls from MIT and had recruited me from their career fair to work with him for the summer. And at the end of the summer said, hey, did you like what you were doing? Um, and I said, yeah, sure I did. Um, and he said, why don't you take the GRE? Um, and he was the only person who uh, encouraged me to do that. Um, if he hadn't said that, I don't think I would have gone to graduate school. Maybe I would have ended up there later on, um, but I really have him to thank and have since thanked him uh, for that. Um, and ultimately chose to um, go to the University of Illinois um, at the time just to pursue a master's um, with Andrew Aline, who I think many of you know. Um, and Andrew really convinced me to go to Illinois um, I, because largely I shared with him um, the importance of me doing research that I thought had impact. Um, he knew I was really passionate about controls. That's his discipline, obviously. And um, he told me um, that he had this project that was about energy efficiency and, and refrigeration. Um, and he said, that might not sound super exciting, but it can have a lot of impact. And I said, all right, sign me up. I will come. Um, and that was one of the best decisions uh, that, I, that I ever made. Um, I don't have another slide about grad school, um, but obviously a lot of really uh, formative years as well. I built a lot of very positive relationships um, that I continue to nurture today. Um, I really can't say enough good things about Andrew, um, but that he continues to be um, a really important mentor to me uh, today. All right, so fast forward a little bit, um, and it's 2015. Um, I got to Purdue, started the Jane Research Lab, and there's really two mantras that I focused on um, and uh, that have gotten me through the tenure track journey. The first is to focus on, on my goals and successes and to try to not get distracted um, by the noise around me and the, and the success of uh, others. Um, and also to remember that there's no single path to success as a professor, um, that I could do it my way. Um, and my research has really been aligned uh, along two visions. Um, the first of these is uh, to reinvent the engineering design process to exploit and enhance the transient performance of thermofluid energy system. So it's kind of a mouthful, but really the goal here um, is to build the tools that we need in order to enable things like fully electrified ground and air vehicles. Um, the reality is that these systems operate in a very dynamic way, which is very different than how they've operated in the past. Um, and reinventing the engineering design process means bringing controls and dynamical analysis further upstream in that design process where they traditionally have not been. And the second is to realize the promise of autonomous systems that are truly collaborative with humans. Very different from one, I'll talk about that briefly, um, but what, again, what is germane to both of these um, is that novel dynamic modeling and state estimation paradigms are really central to tackling both of these challenges. Um, I don't have too much on research, there's not enough time, and I'm pretty sure I'm behind schedule already, but um, first on the topic of that first vision, um, this is a big graph, but I wanted to highlight all of the um, excellent um, faculty and students that I've had the opportunity to work with to start to tackle that first vision, um, not only across a large range of time scales, but also length scales. Um, and the impact uh, here and takeaway is that we've been able to build new ways or design new ways to model very complex and nonlinear systems so that we could actually start to bring um, to bear state estimation control theory, a lot of tools that these systems need but otherwise haven't been able to be applied because no one wanted to tackle the, the, the big modeling challenge um, that existed here. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of faculty in thermodynamics and heat transfer, um, and I very much enjoy working at the boundary of different uh, disciplines. 
Um, the second vision of responsive and adaptive human autonomy teaming is obviously a more substantial departure from what I did as a PhD student. Um, and here I want to briefly comment um, on how those are connected. Um, in graduate school, I became, um, I was doing work on vapor compression systems, building heating and cooling, um, was uh, smart buildings, the term smart buildings was just starting to become important um, and used uh, widely. Um, and the issue of humans, in the, human occupants in that building and how they interact with that automation um, was apparent. And I didn't have an option or an opportunity to work on that, but I kept thinking about why aren't we designing these systems to be more effective to interact with the human occupants. Um, and I really uh, I sort of kept that at the back of my mind for a very long time. Um, and um, it was 2009 when I remember at being at a conference and starting to think about that. Um, and you know, six years later, I had the opportunity as a professor to really go after any challenge I wanted. Um, and through a very serendipitous um, kind of lunch that I had with Tahira Reed Smith, who was a professor here at the time, um, I brought up this idea to her um, of how I really wanted to be able to control how humans trust automation systems. Um, and she didn't, she didn't even blink. She looked at me and said, you know what, I think I have um, some ideas of how you could start to do that or, or an experiment we could do. And a 30-minute lunch turned into writing a proposal that got funded, um, and then several years of collaboration together, starting with her student, Wan Lin Hu, and my student, Kumar Akash, who built um, uh, novel models of how trust evolves when humans interact with um, intelligent decision aids. Um, and there's been a score of different students, and we've slowly started tackling all sorts of different cognitive factors that affect how humans choose to interact with different kinds of autonomous systems. Um, and all of this work led to me uh, writing a successful NSF career award, ultimately in 2022, where we're doing even more fundamental work to tackle uh, this larger problem. OK, a really brief comment about teaching and mentoring. So I guess in the end, <laughs> I kind of did become a math teacher. Um, I've taught a lot of different classes um, here at Purdue, um, mentored a lot of undergraduate and graduate students, um, and have really enjoyed every minute of it. Um, in the context of uh, bringing this back to um, engagement, um, not everything, but a lot of the activities that I've chosen to do and choose to spend my other time in um, are things that impact female students, including being a counselor for the Society of Women Engineers, being the faculty advisor for Phi Sigma Rho, which is the STEM sorority on campus, um, and then trying to engage as much as I can in any other opportunity um, to work with female students, and in fact also serve on the Women Faculty and Engineering Committee as well. Um, one brief comment, I didn't include this here, um, but I um, also want to mention that having female role models isn't just important for our female students, but it's also really important for our male students. Um, and I've had male students email me um, after class and share um, how much they appreciate that as well, which I was surprised by, um, but it happens. And that's, I think, an important thing for folks to know. Um, so a couple acknowledgments. First, I want to thank Anil Bajaj and Eckhard Grohl. Um, uh, Anil was the head when I was hired. Um, and then Eckhard's been the head for the last several years and put me up for tenure um, and have both um, been a huge support. I met Eckhard. He was my host, actually, for my interview um, and met him at that time. Um, and uh, thank you very much for everything you've done. Um, George Chu and Jim Braun, um, who are both my official mentors um, in ME um, and help, have helped me in a number of ways, but I've also had the opportunity to do research with both of them um, and have really enjoyed that. Um, and then really many other uh, people in the department, um, and I didn't want to list, make a list because I knew I would leave someone out invariably. Um, um, and then of course, I need to thank all of the funding sources through which you can't get any of the work done. Um, but the most important acknowledgement is really the students. Um, I know several of my grad students are here. Um, past uh, and current, um, the primary reason I chose to go into academia and not do research in industry is because I wanted to be, I wanted to mentor graduate students. Um, some of this comes from having um, had a, an excellent relationship with my own advisor, um, but I really, really love um, that part of the job. It's my favorite. Um, it's been a joy to work with all of these students. Um, and. You know, I've always wanted to be a teacher because I really wanted to inspire and impact others. Um, but the truth is, as a PhD advisor, as a master's advisor, you get to be inspired by your students too. Um, and that's a very special thing. And then finally, a couple of personal acknowledgments. <laughs> really couldn't do this um, without this guy who I met at the American Control Conference in 2007. So yes, I, I married another controls engineer. Um, and uh, we have got two kids, Rohan, who's here in the front, Rohan Seven, 
Um, it's spring break this week. Um, and then our daughter, Asha, who's four. Um, uh, I wanted to also thank my sister and brother. They live in Chicago. Um, they are, they've supported me my whole life. Um, they are not engineers. <laughs> um, but um, uh, they are, uh, have been a huge source of support, particularly since we had the kiddos. Um, and my mom and dad again, um, but especially my mom, who again has been enormously helpful since we had the children. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanted to say that I felt compelled to say um, is that uh, having two children um, during, I couldn't separate having kids and getting tenure um, uh, because it was um, uh, a big part of that journey. Um, and having two children um, was really, really hard um, in doing that pre-tenure. I want to thank um, everybody in the past who advocated for and implemented the tenure clock extension policy because the reality is without that, I don't think this would have happened or we would have made very different choices. Um, and no one talks about it very much, um, so I think it serves as a good reminder. Um, and while um, being pregnant and teaching pregnant um, was really empowering at times, I hoped that I was an example for students um, who might be thinking about whether that was possible. Um, it was also lonely um, often. Um, and so um, I appreciate so much everyone who has supported me um, uh, and Treyas and made it possible for us um, to, to do this. So with that, uh, thank you. <laughs> I turned it off because I was afraid that it was good. One, two, oh yeah, great. <laughs> thank you, Nira. Thanks for a wonderful yeah, I went presentation. Way over. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was really special. Okay. So I'm glad you brought the personal touch. Uh, we do have time for some questions. Who has uh, questions for Nira? No, we should have like, yes, oh. there we go. You have a microphone there? Great. Hi, Nira. Thanks for Hi, a great Phil. presentation. Um, so moving forward, how do you think we can make um, faculty members who are pregnant feel more included and less lonely? Oh, good question. I don't want, I don't want that to be the focus of it. I think that, um, you know, when I said lonely, it was more that there are some things that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if, folks are choosing not to have families because of the impressions of how difficult it might be, or if they just don't want a family, which is also totally okay. Um, uh, but I think um, just as awareness increases, I think that can help. I think any time that um, uh, also male faculty who maybe have young kids can talk about that and just you know, making normal to talk about your family and the realities of, of how tough that is or, or how it just impacts your ability to get that email written tonight <laughs> um, or send that uh, out on Saturday um, uh, is, as an example, um, my, our first journal article with my first PhD student, we got it submitted maybe two or three months before Rohan was born. The day I was going into labor with him, I got the email from the editor saying it's a revise and resubmit. And this was gonna be, and he wanted it back in a week. Um, and this was gonna be our, my first journal article, and for all the faculty here, you know how important it is. I knew I, I was two years in, and we didn't have a journal article yet. We had to get it um, resubmitted. I emailed him, I said, listen, I'm like on my way to the hospital, um, can I have an extension? And he replied back and said, um, I can give you a week, um, maybe two. And uh, I forwarded it to my student, I replied to him, I said, I'll take two, uh, forwarded it to my student, and yeah, Rohan was born. I still remember being in front of the computer all day. Shreyas and my mom were taking care of him. They kept bringing him in. I'd nurse him. They'd leave. And Austin and I were on the computer all day, punching it out. Um, and, and so it was stuff like that. I was angry about it, you know, <laughs> but whatever, you do it, because I wasn't not going to get it done. Um, but it's, it's little things like that that I think over the years, it was like, ugh, I wish, I wish um, you know, uh, that didn't have to be as hard as it was. Very good. All right. Yeah. Uh, oh. um, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, we're here to celebrate you as a human being, but I think more importantly as a great researcher. Um, so I want to ask you a question about nonlinear dynamics, if yeah. you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, I think we somewhat have similar career path or educational path and we love math at the beginning yeah. and for some reason we all converge towards 
system dynamics, especially dealing with the nonlinear systems. So, so I want to ask you, what was the it factor kind of took you away from sort of a pure, beautiful world of mathematics that got into sort of this somewhat dirty world of mathematics, but yeah. with great applications, and you can really use one full tool of mathematics to deal with real world problems. Yeah, I think that was really, I think it became, um, I'm a pretty pragmatic person, um, and I think that I, I, at least no one showed me um, how to have impact as a pure mathematician, right? It was very clear to me, both through physics, and then I, you know, I started majoring in engineering. Um, and so maybe it's more because I just I sort of stumbled into it because people in my life sort of you know, said, oh, you're good at math and physics, and you like both of those things. Um, this is the sort of path for you. So to be honest, I think that's what it was. But I, you know, I remember thinking, some people you know, really pure, like wonder, like, what makes the planets turn and, you know, um, you, know, these, you know, really think about these big, giant questions. Um, and uh, I, I never did. <laughs> you know, um, I, you know I, was, I don't think I was ever going to be a scientist. Um, I think that my own nature um, is that I just have always been much more um, firmly focused on, on the moment and making something happen now. And so engineering has always been more appealing. Um, and I loved math as a, as a tool to do something. Um, and I can appreciate now, I mean, again, within ME, yes, went into probably the most mathematical field, I think, within, within ME, um, which is a kind of borderline applied math, although an applied mathematician would tell me that I'm kind of crazy. Um, but I think that's kind of the answer, I think. Okay, it's time. Yeah. Oh, is there time for one more question? Okay. Um, hi, Professor Jane. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so this is question kind of pulls back a little bit to your transition between grad and professorship. Um, so as a current PhD candidate, I feel like sometimes um, my ideas of research becomes a little grandiose and my advisor has to pull me back and scope me down and, and some of the things that he says is, you know, this is something that you can pursue in your future research. And so I kind of wonder for you, um, when you were a graduate student, I'm sure you also maybe had some grandiose, um, when was that turning point where you really felt like you started really like doing the impactful research that maybe wasn't in line with uh, like direct projects, but you started like integrating the things that you really cared about into your research? So um. yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, again, it was really, um, I mean, that's the most special thing about this job. Um, there really are very few paths that you can take um, where the sky's the limit. Um, and if you can think of it and if you can get funding for it, no one can really say that you can't work on it. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and I think I felt stifled in some other situations where I wanted to go after something, but I was, you know, I couldn't for a variety of reasons. Um, and so, yeah, it was, I mean, but I think as an assistant professor, that's, that's the whole point, is for you to think big and to go after hard problems that you want to solve. And what I forgot to mention in the talk um, is that it was really risky, um, I think, for me to do what I did with Tahira. Um, and uh, again, it was a totally new area. I had zero background in it. Um, and I didn't put all my eggs in that basket. So if it had flopped, you know, I had other backup plans. Um, but it turned, um, it was a risk that for sure paid off in every possible way. And that was something that um, when I was writing my, I'll say this now, writing my research statements uh, to apply to universities for faculty positions, I think I had something about the human stuff in there and my advisor said, cut it out. Um, he said that is gonna get viewed um, as soft engineering um, and uh, it might not be viewed the way that you want it to in a mechanical engineering department, I'd hold off. Um, and so I did, I didn't say anything about it. Um, but once you get the job, <laughs> you can kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> um, and I don't know if his advice was good or not, um, but you know, I think that, that was the advice I got. And, um, and so I'm really glad that I did that. I'm really glad, I couldn't have done it without Tahira, and I'm really glad that I found a partner um, to pursue that with. Okay, we are out of time. Uh, we have uh, two more. Thank you very much, Nira. It was great, really wonderful.